Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, your home for movie news, reviews, and movie fan views. That is right. This is the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunleavy. I'm joined by my co-host, Rob Dunham. In honor of Zack Snyder, this episode is going to be five hours long. <laughs> no, it isn't. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <I'm fine. laughs> so, rate, subscribe, and tell your friends about the podcast. We would love it. We hope you would love it. And um, if you don't, Joss Whedon will direct all future movies. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. Oh, poor Joss Whedon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, we've got a great show for you. Uh, we will, of course, delve into the Snyder Cut of Justice League. Uh, we will be talking about John Wick 4 and 5 getting a new writer. Helen Mirren is apparently the villain in Shazam 2. And Black Widow gets delayed because Disney sucks. And they lie. They are lying liars who tell lies. Yes, they are. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's let's jump in. Uh, let's start out with let's start out with some John Wick. All right. So the the report is that John Wick four and five are of course going ahead, but they will not be retaining. Uh, the franchise architect, Garrett Kolstad. Now, he was the one who wrote the original screenplay. He's the one who set up the universe and created it and was heavily involved in the first three movies. He will not be returning for four and five. Uh, this was not his decision. Uh, apparently, the studio decided it was time to move on. Uh, it's interesting how he put it. Um, he basically said, you know, there comes to a point in contracts and things I shared credit with a number of people. They didn't have to come back to me, so they didn't. And he said, at some point, they tell you that your project has graduated beyond you. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I think this is an interesting turn of events because I think what really the universe he created and the framework that he set up is really what drove those three stories. Uh, so it's a bit of a surprise, I guess, that they the studio chose not to retain him considering how successful the first three movies were. What are your thoughts? I would say he's arguably created uh, maybe the only standalone successful action series of the last decade. Hmm. So to like move away from him is a puzzling decision to me. Um, I guess you could argue like... Um, Maybe the Kingsmen could be in there or uh, the Bourne Supremacy, if we're looking back a little, the Bourne movies, if you're looking back a little farther, but those are based off of books. This is like an entirely self-created thing yeah. that was not from any source material. It's just something he came up with. Um, the level of detail in the world, when you look at the three movies as a whole, is pretty impressive. And Keanu Reeves is definitely the right person for that character. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, if someone else is coming in and writing for these next two movies, are they going to be able to keep the same atmosphere and the same vibes going that are present in the first three? Because although each of the three is different from each other, they have that same feel, that same world, uh, everything centered around the hotel and the exchange and everything. It all feels very connected. So whoever does come in has a tall task out of them to keep that energy going, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think they're keeping some of the other people, like the director and, and some some of the other writers. But it is it is surprising with, with that level of success that they the studio would tell would tell the, the creator, uh, we don't need you anymore. And I thought he had an interesting perspective because he said, you know, it looks, it's something that you look at and you could be hurt. And, you know, if I would say it was 20 years ago, I would have been hurt. But seeing what the industry is and how things go, I just believe that you bless everything and hope it all the best. And I think that's, 
I mean, that's that's a really big attitude. <laughs> that's a that re- sounds like someone who has been hurt before by things and has uh, decided to uh, use that experience to be more mature and to mm-hmm. take a higher ground when something like this happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's really easy to be bitter over something like that, but it seems like he's not. So good for Derek Kolstad and hopefully we'll see more of him in the future and when he comes up with uh, some more good ideas. All right, so our second story is an interesting one. Um, Shazam 2 is in the works and apparently the villain will be Helen Mirren, which is an interesting choice. Um, They don't yet know exactly what role Helen Mirren will play, But the idea of a Shazam movie with Helen Mirren as the bad guy is intriguing, I would say. Um, She is obviously a very, very talented actress. Um, But I think in order to pull this off and this to be something worthwhile, I think they're really going to have to do a good job on the script with this one. Because I don't immediately see how how this how this would work out super well and be super engaging but i think that has potential well i think if you look at uh the first shazam and uh the character of shazam that he gets his powers from is like an old wizened dude um so i definitely think there's a space in there for there to be kind of maybe uh an archetypal villain opposite that or something along that line that is Um, someone who is well-traveled and has been through a lot of this universe and has a lot of knowledge and wisdom and more, maybe more of a mental kind of villain than like a physically active villain. And I think Helen Mirren is, would be fantastic for that kind of role Mm -hmm. because like you said, she's a talented actress. Uh, She's definitely got, you know, the chops and the resume to be able to do anything she wants to probably um, it's hard to it's hard to argue that uh it's a bad casting choice whenever Helen Mirren's name is involved <laughs> yeah and she has such a cloud at this point that she would not sign on to a project that she didn't think had a good direction to it so I think that bodes something well for it and she does have an edge to her like there's definitely an edge to her an attitude about her that can definitely work Uh, from the villain side of it. So um, it will be intriguing to see. I mean, I thought the first Shazam movie was surprisingly good. Um, It was, it had, it was heartfelt. It was engaging. It had, it had good amount of humor in it. So I thought that was, uh, I thought it was well done. So I think there's potential in here, but we know with, uh, with some of the DC characters that second movies have proven to be problematic. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll see, (laughs) we'll see how it goes, but uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep in track of this as uh, Shazam fury of the gods uh, continues to get underway. Look forward to that coming out and we'll see what Helen Mirren does. Now, our third story is just annoying. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like they listen to our podcast and we talk about these things and then they're like, you know what? No, just no. <laughs> just no. You we, can't have good we things. You were just kidding. You've been pumped. So, okay. The story is that Black Widow has been delayed to July 9th. But Ryan, didn't they just like announce last week that uh, it would not be delayed and would come out at its normal release date? Yes, they did. (laughs) Yes, they did. From none other than the CEO of Disney. (laughs) So that's a thing now. So I think he should change his title to the CLO, Corporate Lying Officer. I I mean, there's really no other explanation for it (laughs) other than they were just freaking lying to us. (laughs) I don't understand how I don't understand how in a matter of like a week or two weeks that they go from being adamant about releasing the film in May 
to being, eh, nah, let's, let's wait a few more months. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but the details are, it has been delayed back to July 9th. And it will also simultaneously debut on Disney Premium Access, which means you will have to pay $30 for it, similar to what they did with Mulan, uh, if you want to watch it on Disney Plus when it first comes out. So they're, they're going to be a dual release for that. Uh, but this is, this is disappointing. This is disappointing. I think I've been most disappointed with Disney over their handling on some of this stuff. Um, and it seems like, I, I don't know exactly what they're doing. Um, it, it seems like they don't, they must not all be on the same page given the announcements from the CEO and um, then, then this delay. Yeah. Um, you do have to wonder how successful it will be with the premier access uh, gatekeeping figure. But I will say that out of the movies that have released via that method, I think this one has the chance to make the most money. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think most people will want to watch this out of the ones they have released that way. Uh, I'm going to go back and give myself like, a uh, slight partial credit because when we were talking about where things were heading with movies several months ago, I said, don't be surprised if Black Widow ends up coming out on Disney Plus. And although it's not exclusively coming out on Disney Plus, it is coming out on Disney Plus. So I'm giving myself partial credit for that. Yeah, partial. I think maybe you can get partial credit for that. I don't <laughs> know if we want to go too far on the credit here. So, yeah. So I mean, that, I'm not happy that I'm getting partial credit. Let's be clear. <laughs> I would rather not have, have been correct about this, but um, I'm not entirely surprised. Yeah, so Disney is also delaying other movies. Free Guy moves to August 13th from May. The King's Man goes to December 2021, supposed to come out in August. And Death on the Nile moves all the way to February of next year which I was really intrigued to see that in December of last year. Yeah, so, this is the longest death I've ever heard of. I know. So Disney, I, I'm, I'm disappointed with Disney in that they're really not putting out a lot of their products right now. So they're not contributing to the return of the theaters. So I need to, I need to get on them about that. Not that <laughs> that's in the mail. <laughs> Send them a strongly worded email. <laughs> I need to write... reply to with lies. And then, yeah, yeah. I need a Joe Bluth strongly worded letter. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, Disney. Done with you. Just what? done with you entirely. <laughs> All right. So, so let's, let's get on to our discussion. So our discussion topic is, of course, Zack Snyder's Justice League. So those of you who've been following the podcast will know that uh, several of us put out a roundtable discussion immediately after we watched it last Saturday. Uh, that was our immediate reactions. Unfortunately, Rob was not able to attend. So now that uh, I've had a little bit more time to break it down and think about it, and Rob, uh, Rob has seen the movie, we thought we'd spend a few minutes talking about the movie. So how we're going to do this is We'll start out with just our initial reactions, our initial thoughts on the movie and how it went. We won't give away any spoilers in this segment. So if you want to hear how what we thought about the movie, you can do that without getting spoilers. Then we'll give you a spoiler warning and we'll jump into the details. All right, Rob, hit me with it. What'd you think? Well, first of all, I'm going to need you to do some video editing so that this portion of the podcast can be presented in four by three format because that is my vision <laughs> as a podcast creator that the people would be able to see it in that aspect ratio. Um, <laughs> for those of you who have not seen the movie yet, it is in four by three, which is not widescreen, which is not. a very interesting choice for a like futuristic sci-fi, lots of action, lots of special effects movie. Very. I big will time. say, I will say, I don't. It might be because I have a giant projector screen, uh, but it didn't suffer from that very much to me. It still looked very uh, clean and well shot. Well, well shot. Um, 
you know, I'm not sure what, what we would have missed or what we gained by changing the aspect ratio, but apparently that was Zack Snyder's vision for this. Um, I would say my broad general thoughts after seeing it, I have to put my hands up and say that I was uh, probably wrong about my feelings towards this movie before it came out. Cause I was very, very skeptical. And although it's not a perfect movie by any stretch, I think it is a far superior movie to the version of the justice league that was released in the theater. And uh, I can see why some people, who were involved in the movie were disappointed with what happened to their characters and to the movie in general. Uh, because I, I was talking to Ryan earlier and I, I said, this is like an entirely different movie. It's almost, it's almost mind blowing how different this is <laughs> from the uh, uh, version they released in the theater. Um, I would argue that it's in the top five of movies that have come out under the DC name. Um, I get, you could argue where it belongs in there, but I think that it's pretty high up there. Uh, and that's my general broad thoughts. So we'll get some more specific things in a bit. But uh, I, I actually haven't had a chance to talk to you about this. So um, what did you think? Yeah, so my initial reaction was um, that I thought it was a significantly better movie than the original Justice League, but I also went in with low expectations. Um, so it, it, I think the more I've thought about it and the more I've processed it, the more I think it, it was a significantly better movie than even I originally, than my original take on it. Um, I was also in the room with the number of, with a number of people who were not as big a fan of it, which we'll get into when we get into the specifics. Um, so once I did the processing of it, I... I think I was I was very impressed with how he was able to tell a cohesive story, and how um, it was a unified vision. It was absolutely a unified vision. It was uh, it was well done. Uh, it was long. I mean, you certainly got the you. It was long, <laughs> and and so there are downsides to that for sure. Um, but I think had this been the version that was released in, in theaters, obviously we had to shorten it a little bit, but had Zack Snyder been able to fulfill his vision, I think you would have, uh, DC would be in a much better place right now. And the rumor is that he had uh, been pushing for a three to three and a half hour length movie. And the studio had said it needs to be two hours. And he said, well, I can't do anything less than two and a half. Yeah. And at that point, they were so far apart that, uh, and this was for a little more backstory, this was all happening around the time his daughter uh, passed away. And so he was not prepared to like get involved in a major fight over this because there was too much stuff going on at home. Um, I think that the... The, probably the best version of this movie is somewhere in between the original one that was released in the theater and his uh, complete director's cut that just came out. I think somewhere in the three hour range, I think would, would have been the best version of this movie. But I think that he did what he did with this version because he wanted to just put it all out there and say, this is exactly what I would have done if I wouldn't have had any restrictions at all. Um, and I, I think that uh it's a good movie very like you said cohesive very unified but uh, i think at the length it is it's a movie that would not have done super well in the theater because people just would not have had the patience or i'm a very story driven drama person but a lot of people are not that especially when they're going to see a superhero movie yeah and I think <laughs> the reason and we'll get into this more in the specifics i think the reason the length ended up being what it was is DC's decision to wrap in characters that had not already been treated with their own movies. Unlike what Marvel did, where all of the main characters, the primary characters had movies or had significant roles in some of the other characters' movies before the Avengers came out. So you did not have to spend as much time on introducing and developing characters which is something that Justice League was plagued with 
and that they were introducing half the cast for the first time. So that that is, I think, one of the reasons why the length ended up being what it was. Yeah, essentially you had um, like Cyborg and The Flash, the amount of uh, content on them in this movie was uh, it, almost like a movie within a movie. <laughs> yeah. So, but they were almost cut completely out of the original version. Mm -hmm. So there had to be a balance in between those two things and not one extreme or the other. Yeah. All right. So uh, any other initial reactions before we jump into the specifics? I think I'm ready to get specific with it. All right. So uh, this is your spoiler alert. We are now going to jump into details of the movie. So if you don't want any spoilers, you can skip ahead. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, you can check out in the comments uh, how far you got to follow uh, to get to the next section. All right. Let's 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 do it, Rob. Um, give me a couple of the strengths you thought this movie had. Uh, I think I, I've already briefly touched on it, but the biggest strength to me is giving everyone who is a part of the Justice League a voice in the movie because that did not happen in the original version. I remember when I watched the original version kind of thinking like, okay, why is Cyborg in this movie? <laughs> yeah. Because I know nothing about this person. Why is he here? And in this movie, they completely showed his backstory. They had scenes with him and his father, with him and his mother. Um, they showed, I think, most importantly, uh, the extent of his abilities and why he was a valuable and important member of the team. Which, if you're not going to show that, kind of ruins like the point of having a character in the movie. Uh, yeah. I would say the same thing with The Flash. It can, I think it can be argued maybe for both characters that in this cut, there's almost too much backstory. Um, but I would say that's my preference to none. And uh, to see kind of where Barry uh, discovers his powers, how he uses them. And there were several very cool scenes of uh, the Flash using his powers to like reverse time, to make things happen, to spark off things that we didn't see in the original version. And like uh, the biggest thing for me, like the original version, it was so not coherent to me that I remember almost none of it. If that makes any sense yeah. compared to this, which was like just really well told. Uh, another thing that I would say, and I, 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 I saw the first couple parts and I thought it was after the first couple parts was like you said, uh, the storyline makes sense. It flows together uh it's not hard to follow um we understand better the motivations of the bad guys which i think really suffered in the original version uh we understand what exactly they're trying to do and how and we understand how the justice league is coming together the difficulties of that and the uh triumph when they actually get it all together it's just uh it's a well-told story it's, um, I would say it's almost maybe um, too well told, if that makes any sense. Like I said, I'm a big fan of exposition. Uh, this almost feels like it could have been, a, and I know it was talked about at some point, like releasing it in parts. Like it almost feels like it could have been a miniseries as opposed to one four hour long movie. Um, but I like how the story is told because I'm a big drama person. Yeah. yeah. But I could see how someone would be like, disengaged after a bit because it does go for quite a while um i also think uh, i'll give one other thing i just think that uh the movie was very polished uh cinematography wise shot wise uh didn't seem like there was much misplaced or much unnecessary when it came to how it was shot i guess you could argue some of the slow motion was um overutilized but that's Zack snyder <laughs> i don't think you should be too surprised by that uh, I think some of the scenes towards the end of the movie, uh, one that sticks out in my mind is when Clark is on the ship right before he blasts off into space and we get to see him break through the atmosphere and like hang in space again. It's a really cool moment uh, with like him hearing his dad's voice from Krypton and his dad's voice from Earth in his head, like going back and forth. That was really cool, I thought. 
Uh, I just think stylistically there were a lot of really smart choices made in how the movie was put together. So my my overall feeling is positive. Uh, there are some slight negative things we might talk about, but I would say overwhelmingly uh, I was impressed with the final product. All right. So All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll break down a little bit here. Uh, so my my I think I think you're right on with the, the cyborg. I think one of the primary benefits of this movie is the way a cyborg is handled. Um, he was unlikable in the original Justice League movie. He was brooding. He was moody. There was nothing about the character, even with his backstory, there was very little about the character that made him likable and relatable. And as you indicated, he was largely irrelevant. Whereas in the Snyder cut, he gets a great backstory. He gets great treatment as to where he was coming from, what was going on with his dad. Even his dad gets a great character arc uh, and a redemption story that is vitally important to the to the film and with the introduction of a greater role for him and his father and star labs in particular the the role they play and you see the integral nature of what cyborg brings to the team so i thought he was one of the primary beneficiaries of of zach snyder in the full version so I think that was one of my first ones. Um, you're right on with the flash as well. Um, the flash was largely used to just move people from one place to another. And <laughs> <laughs> in the original one, um, there was one scene that I, I wish they'd kept in, in the, with the flash in the original, in the original, from the original version, but the flash was given significantly more um, to do. And in particular, how I loved how, as you indicated, your it, it gives more dimension to his speed. Um, and I love how they hinted at what the ending was going to be by um, having him slightly reverse time when he goes to charge up the mother box to revive Superman. Just gives you a little bit of uh, foreshadowing for where, where they were going to head towards the end of the movie. Um, the motivation for uh, Steppenwolf was also a huge, huge advantage, a huge advantage. Uh, he was just there. He was just generic bad guy. He was just there in the first, in the first movie, understanding where he's at, what he is doing, the role of dark side and where dark side was coming from. So what did you, uh, what did you think? What, what did you think of the slow motion? I mean, this is clearly a Zack Snyder thing. What mm -hmm. do you think about the slow motion? Uh, a I lot think, of it over the first half of the movie, in particular. Yeah. So I think, in general, uh, it's an effective tool if you were to take each scene separately by itself. But I do think that when you have so many scenes that use it, it can lose some of its effectiveness. Yeah, and I just think that's the danger of of Zack Snyder being Zack Snyder. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think we've seen we've seen. Uh, I was I would have a similar criticism of like the movie Sucker Punch, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, that I think the scenes by themselves are usually really beautiful, mm -hmm. like especially the one I'm thinking of in this movie in particular is when the Flash like slows down time to save the girl from crashing into the um, garbage truck. Yeah. Like that's a beautiful, beautiful scene. Like, especially with all the electricity going around and. Well, um, I mean, it's and fitting because crashed. the flash is really fast. Like that's yeah. the time where slow motion makes sense. The other one, other times it was just a, it was just a cinematography choice. Yeah. Him grabbing a hot dog out of midair as time was frozen <laughs> and putting it in his pocket. Classic. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, it's, it does seem like uh, slow motion is almost a crutch for uh, Snyder. Um, I'm not sure why it's his like thing, but. <laughs> well, I think it's especially apparent because so much of the first half, the first two hours is background, backstory, introduction to, to characters. And he was very heavy on the slow motion. 
in those. So it was almost predictable. It'd be like, cut to the character, cut to the slow motion backstory, cut yeah. to the character, cut to the slow motion backstory. So it was, it was to the point where it was, it's, it was a little bit to the point where it stopped being like, Hey, this is a cool scene. And it started being noticeable. Oh, he's using slow motion again. So. I mean, cause there are some points in the movie that um, it's really cool. Like when Superman is fighting against Steppenwolf and flies towards him and then slowly turns to avoid him. I thought that was really like, that was a cool shot. And the other one that I think was hyper effective was when the flash was going flash speed and trying to go help with as they were fighting against Superman who wasn't quite sure who he was yet and mm -hmm. Superman turned and looked at him because uh, that's not allowed <laughs> 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 but and his eyes when he sees that Superman is turning and looking at him it's like um, no that doesn't happen what's going on <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah. there are other scenes where it's just not necessary in the same way mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that that this movie had that I think really helped it was with the with the length of it was the role of the role of Superman becomes more important. It's smaller in terms of the scope of the whole movie, but they spend a longer time with Batman trying to come up with a way to defend Earth trying to come up with a team, trying to struggle against Steppenwolf. And there's more of a, there's more of a sense of desperation of we're trying on our own and it just won't work. And so the arrival of Superman means more because there was more of the movie at which they were setting up that it's not gonna work without Superman. So I thought that was a time when the length actually worked to its favor because I think it's probably like two thirds of the movie at least does not feature Superman. Yeah. And so, and so you feel that absence, you feel the absence of Superman. And then once he returns, bow, like it changed, things changed. There is a, they did an incredible job of creating gravity around Superman. Yeah, it was, it was very effective in that uh, as they're talking about what the mother box can do and um, the Flash, uh, Barry Allen says, I'm not going to say it, but I think we're all thinking it. And then Cyborg just like uh, hologram transmits uh, Superman onto the top of the mother box. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're all thinking. You made a really good point there about um, the gravity of Superman. I think that that can be applied to pretty much every character in this movie which it's funny because watching Wonder Woman in this movie makes me actually dislike Wonder Woman 1984 even more <laughs> because in this movie, she's yeah. like effective. She is a fighting machine. She, you know, the, the parts where she's talking, not so great <laughs> sometimes because <laughs> I just don't think she's a great actor uh, personally, but um, her character felt more like an actual like effective weapon in this movie than she does at any point in 84. Mm -hmm. There is, there is though that, uh, that relatively unnecessary scene where at the beginning, where instead of just grabbing the guy's gun, she just decides to knock out half a building. Yeah. Rid of him. I mean, that was, I mean, that was kind of funny. Uh, you're just like, I'm the whole time I'm sitting there. It's like, grab the gun, grab the gun, grab the gun. And no, she's just boom. The whole building blows out. <laughs> Okay, I guess we're yeah. going that route. Another funny thing is that uh, so we watch things with subtitles often because of kids being asleep and not wanting to turn the sound all the way up and wake them up. Uh, but there are so many different scenes in this movie with Diana and the Amaz Amazons where uh, up in the subtitles, like when music plays sometimes, it'll say like what kind of music it is. <laughs> and there are multiple times in this movie where it just comes up with ancient lamentation music. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently that's the song of the Amazons, ancient lamentation music. That's mm -hmm. their jam. Yeah. And I think for me, the, 
on, on the broader stroke, I've always liked Zack Snyder's visual style. And I do think his visual style lends itself well to comic book, graphic novel. It looks like that type of style. Uh, so I think he does a better job than almost anybody in creating that kind of that kind of style. And I just felt like having him get to do his his thing, I think ultimately proved to be much more positive than I thought it was gonna be. So I agree. Uh, what let's let's get into a few of the weaknesses. Uh what what do you think wasn't quite right or or got got missed or any any weaknesses? I would say like the weakness is something that for me, the major weakness is something that for me is a strength. And I've already talked about that exposition. Mm-hmm. And I just think uh, it's weak in the sense that this version of the movie, in my opinion, could never come out in theaters because I don't think it would have engaged the general audience. Uh, it's perfect for someone like me who loves drama and loves yeah. drawn out storytelling, but that is not like the majority of people, I think, um, especially when they go to see a superhero movie. So I think the, and I've said already, the ideal version of this movie probably would have been somewhere between the original two-hour version and this four-hour version. Um, but I think this was his reaction to being so unhappy with what happened with the original version. So he went all the way on, on his... I don't think there's much that's like wasted storytelling-wise, but I think that there that doesn't mean that there's stuff that we couldn't have taken out. Like I still think there's at least a half an hour to an hour of stuff that didn't necessarily need to be in the movie. I think it helped the movie. Like I said, it almost feels like more of a, a mini series kind of feel if we're going to keep that much storytelling in it. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One for me was, uh, and you mentioned it earlier is I thought the four, three aspect ratio was just distracting. I kept wondering where the rest of the picture was. <laughs> like, it's just, like you're seeing a big epic scene and you feel like you're not getting the whole, the whole time. I'm just feeling like I'm not getting the whole, the whole picture. Did it ruin the movie? No, no, it didn't ruin the movie, but it was a distraction. It was enough of a distraction that, you know, sometimes when you're watching something, you eventually get used to something you get used to a, a, a visual element or you get used to it. i don't know that i ever really got used to the fact that it was in four to three hmm. so for me i thought that was a negative i know it had something to do with filming for imax and then with not getting a theatrical release then that kind of renders that moot so i i thought that was a negative uh one of the other things for me and we'll get your get your thoughts on this is this was brought up on our on our instant reaction by some of the other guys is their treatment of Superman. And Zack Snyder in particular, the treatment of Superman where they felt Superman was much too violent and much too corruptible, as it were. Mm. Um, whereas if you're if you're truly trying to stay true to Spider-Man or Spider-Man, geez, Superman as written, he is the ultimate uncorruptible force. And what really, and they always bring out the point where where his greatest superpower is his goodness. And with the Zack Snyder version, there's always a more of, of a flawed human side to, to Superman. So um, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that take? I mean, I would argue, I, I think that that might have more of an argument in some of the other movies that have been done where Superman's like a major part of the story. But in this movie, I think, I really think it can be explained by um, using the mother box to bring him back to life. There was like an alien entity or something going on that, brought him when he first came back as not his entirely normal self. And I, I don't like, uh, I would hesitate to say that he is perfect. And I don't think the comic books and other movies in the past necessarily paint him as being perfect. Like he does have weaknesses. Yeah. So if he has weaknesses physically, uh, I think it would stand to reason that he could be impacted by 
an outside unexpected force, which I think being brought back to life by an alien technology would qualify. Uh, in fact, the ship itself is like, don't do this thing. Stop <laughs> doing this thing. I don't like it because I think, um, as we know, the ship has like the consciousness of like the Kryptonian people. So if it's being like, don't do this thing, like you would think that maybe it would have some worry about how it would impact him uh, when he does come back to life. So I think that in this movie in particular, I don't see it as being necessarily a huge negative because I think it can be explained by that reality that he's being jolted out of non-existence by a force that uh, he's never encountered before. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, last, last, last comment on this before we, before we move on. Uh, thoughts on the epilogue? Uh, I like when a movie ties up the story, but, and, and some of the epilogue did that, but then some of it was confusing yeah. <laughs> to me, like the whole nightmare, uh, scene, alternate reality thing that I'm not sure what exactly is happening, who all the people are and if it's real or not is somewhat confusing. And, uh, the, the Martian manhunter scene at the end kind of seemed almost irrelevant uh he, like he shows up in one scene earlier in the movie where it's martha but not and yeah. uh that we'll was that, that yeah. was odd <laughs> and uh so like i i saw someone reference reference the any scene with martian manhunter as a pointless ps3 cutscene. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have to go. I have to go back to the Martian Manhunter as Martha scene. Um, that was another one I would classify probably as a negative. Like it was a way to introduce the Martian Manhunter and a kind of a way to motivate Lois. But that scene, it was so good between Martha yeah. and Lois, and then it basically renders every good thing that they did in that scene worthless. And as it was pointed out, it's not like these two characters are never going to see each other again. And which should be like, hey, do you remember that time you came to the office and really talked to me? No, no, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I, don't I don't remember that. What I happened? saw someone on Reddit posted, uh, <laughs> Lois, hey, Martha, thanks for coming by and seeing me the other day. Martha, confused Nick Young face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So I thought, I mean. I, and with back to the epilogue, like I thought it was interesting, but not helpful. So especially knowing that we're not, we're basically not going to get the remainder of him telling this story. Yeah. So it's like, I wanted to make it this way and I'm going to put this in here no matter what, even though we're not going to go this direction, we're not going to wrap this up and it creates more confusion. I'm going to do it anyway. I do think the uh, the like uh, three minutes of Jared Leto in this movie were better than his entire movie. So yes, yes. I mean that's not really like saying something amazingly positive about his part in this movie. Just saying something very negative about his full movie. <laughs> yeah, he was his role and the character of Joker was significantly better than Suicide Squad. Yeah, We're, we don't have to go go into. That. <laughs> All right, so uh, check out the, the Justice League Snyder Cut. Now, interesting facts, they're actually putting out a black and white version as well. Mm. So that should be on HBO Max as well. So if you want to watch it again and spend four hours watching it in black and white, go for that. Uh, also, the stat came out that 10% of the movie is actually in slow motion. Wow. <laughs> so when we're making the comment that there's a lot of slow motion, it's 10% of the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty significant amount of slowness. Which on a four-hour movie is 40 minutes. So yeah. <laughs> a long time. All right. So that's the Justice League Snyder cut. Now let's let's move on to our watch list. Movies that we watched over the past week. So I'll I'll, I'll start out on this one. So I am continuing my tour through uh, 90 cinema. And I watched The Patriot Games, which is the Jack Ryan novel, uh, based on the Jack Ryan novel starring Harrison Ford. Came out in 1992. Young Sean Bean plays the primary uh, adversary. 
And in this case, uh, the Jack Ryan character is in London and manages to foil an assassination attempt on a member of the royal family. And this IRA member who was attempting this assassination gets a personal vendetta and spends the rest of the movie trying to kill Jack Ryan. Uh, really good. The, the original trilogy of uh, Jack Ryan movies, Hunt for Red October, Patriot Games, and Clear and Present Danger were all very, very good movies. Very reminiscent of the best of 90s action. So watch that one. Um, as I recommended to everyone last week, watch I watched the air up there with Kevin Bacon. Thank you, Rob, for finding that on Hoopla. That was that was a good find. I keep forgetting to check Hoopla half the time for movies when I'm looking <laughs> for them. I keep forgetting I have that out. Um, so air up there, good movie. I, I it's been a long time since I watched it. Kevin Bacon, of course, is is Kevin Bacon, and it's hard for Kevin Bacon not to be Kevin Bacon, but. He plays a good role. And it was, I was wondering if I was going to get Kenya flashbacks because he goes to Kenya and I was in Kenya a couple of years ago for uh. a few weeks. Uh, but he is way out in the bush hanging out with tribesmen. And I spent most of my time in a couple of different urban areas in the cities in Kenya. So it really wasn't a Kenya flashback for me, but good movie. It's a, it's a good movie. And I watched the mighty ducks. Fantastic Black. movie one of the best kids movies and we've talked about this for a while they just don't make movies like this anymore this is this is not just hey here's a cheap storyline for kids this is a legitimately good movie that they actually put some time effort and energy into that it comes with a good story it builds great character development it's fun and entertaining it has themes for adults and themes for kids so more movies like the mighty ducks please agreed what you got, Rob? Well, I watched Zack Snyder's The Justice League. Yes, you did. <laughs> but I also watched, uh, I really actually only have like one other movie that I watched this week because of my ridiculous schedule right now. Uh, but I watched Breakfast at Tiffany's, which I had never watched before. Uh, okay. So that was quite an interesting experience. Uh, my wife is just watching the Audrey Hepburn documentary upstairs yes. while we're recording this. <laughs> oh, look at that. Synchronicity. I've I'm a big fan of Audrey Hepburn. Um, my wife knows that too, so I'm not uh, revealing any secrets here. Um, but I just think, like, when I think of classy uh, actress with like style and grace, Audrey Hepburn is like right up top of my list. Uh, Roman Holiday is a movie I really, really love that she's in. And so this movie is interesting because she's playing more of a flawed character who isn't settled in life and is trying to figure out how exactly to you know navigate the world doesn't want to become attached to anybody is afraid of commitment and um she plays the character incredibly well in my opinion uh what's really interesting have you seen this movie uh parts of it i don't know if i've seen so, the thing. her landlord her asian landlord is played by mickey rooney and <laughs> so mickey rooney has like i'm pretty sure he has makeup on to look more tan has giant false teeth in his mouth and talks <laughs> in like a horrendously caricatured asian accent and all i could think of every time he was in, like this movie would never see the light of day today <laughs> because this is incredibly racist <laughs> like to the point where like the guy the character he's playing lays on the ground and has like a paper lantern laying over his bed. And every time he gets up, he hits his head on it. Like, ha ha ha, look at the dumb Asian guy. And it's just, like, it's so uh, like, so unnecessary, but so of the time, I guess. Uh, but watching it now, it feels like really uncomfortable. <laughs> Grinch worthy is like, we don't treat people like that anymore. Well, try not to, at least uh, when it comes to media. Um, but Audrey Hepburn in this movie is great. The script is great. Uh, someone struggling with actually committing to something and going for it is I think a theme that we still see in movies now we'll probably see for all time uh so it's really a timeless kind of uh movie and uh the movie itself and her character Holly Go Lightly are like really uh, embedded in the culture now if you follow movies if you know anything about movies you've heard those things before 
And I think there's a reason that it's so well received. I don't think it's like the best movie I've ever seen or even like phenomenal, but it was very good. Um, so if you have never seen Breakfast at Tiffany's, I would recommend it. Just be warned about the crazy white guy playing an Asian in an incredibly racist fashion. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I eventually I will have to watch the whole thing because my wife will make me. But <laughs> um, I did watch Roman Holiday with her last year, I think. And maybe one other one or something around. But she is who you think of when you think of classic cinema. Yeah, is one of the people you think of. Um, she's she's one of those uh, archetypes of of like the grace and beauty of cinema. So yeah, I'd say like Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Rita Hayworth, these kind of people mm -hmm. are who you associate with that. Yeah. Good. Okay. So like we did on last week's podcast, we are going to have a theme for our recommendations for this week. So with Major League Baseball coming, opening day coming up on April 1st, we thought we would talk about our favorite baseball movies. And so I'll let Rob start on this one. So we're going to recommend to you baseball movies that you need to check out, watch them before opening day, get yourself in the mood for the upcoming baseball season. So I would say my favorite baseball movie of all time is The Natural, starring Robert Redford. Um, I think that uh, it's an incredibly moving story about a guy who has lost his way. Life has not turned out the way that he hoped it would. And it's a look back at his life to that point, but also um, looking at his desires, hopes, dreams to be able to overcome that and to start over. And the music in the scene where he hits home run and knocks out the light uh, is something that's played in baseball stadiums all over the country. Like probably every game you're going to hear it at least once, especially when the team is down and needs a rally <laughs> uh, or there's a big moment coming up in the game. It's just classic. Um, Robert Redford is fantastic in this movie, uh, carries it, strikes out Babe Ruth. I mean, what more can you ask from somebody? Um, I think I watched the movie about a billion times when I was a kid because it's one of my dad's favorite baseball movies. But it's my favorite all-time baseball movie, uh, The Natural. Nice. Yes. Yeah, I need, to, I need to watch it again. It's been too long. Um, I, I'll, I'll give another one uh, as well. There's a movie in a completely different vein called Sugar, which was an independent movie that came out in uh, the 2000s about... Uh, I believe Dominican baseball player, not, not a real, it's not a documentary, but um, the story is one that's very relevant and real to a lot of people's experiences who come from uh, Latin America to play baseball in the United States named uh, Sugar Santos. He's a pitcher and it follows his story as he tries to navigate just existing in the United States. And I think before seeing this movie, I did not have quite the appreciation I do for the situation of some of these players the uh the culture difference and shock uh is something that i don't think we appreciate enough or give enough respect to as fans of baseball we just kind of look at players and say hey do that thing you're supposed to do and we don't really think about the fact that they're actual functioning human beings with lives um one scene in particular that really stuck out to me was uh he and his teammates all go out to eat uh, food and he can only he eats like the same thing for a month straight because it's the only thing he knows how to say on the menu hmm. and like we don't think about things like that but for someone who's coming to the country who does not know the language I, I'm that kind of thing must be intimidating and scary and you know something that they, they, they probably just want to play baseball and you know not to get too deep into the weeds or make excuses for people, but uh, it is a reality that some of the issues that um, were had by players with uh, steroid testing and things along that line, uh, players from Latin America were like, were not, were uh, being tested positive at a like uh, exorbitant percentage. And some of the argument for that could be that they didn't 
understand everything and you know whether or not that's someone's responsibility to make sure that they're aware um this movie really shines light on the fact that it's not just as simple as well you should know (laughs) um because they just don't know and um so i would recommend watching it. it's called sugar uh it feels very much like you're watching someone's real life and it's heartbreaking at times but also very encouraging at times and feels very real especially how uh the story plays out and how it ends like a lot of these people who come over to play baseball do not end up playing major league baseball so what happens to all these people um where do they go uh what do they end up doing and it really shines light on all that yeah, so I'm having a hard time narrowing my list down because there are so many good baseball movies. There are just so many. Some ones I left off the list. I left off Field of Dreams because we've actually talked about that quite a bit on the podcast. So I decided not to reference that one. Also, Mr. Baseball with Tom Selleck is fantastic where he goes over to Japan and has to play in the Japanese league, which is really, really good. But I chose, I chose three. I chose number one, Moneyball. Moneyball came out a number of years ago. It's based on the the story of the 2002 A's baseball team. And this was kind of the invent of where Moneyball was really first tried in the major leagues with uh, Billy Bean and the Oakland A's uh, with their fantastic teams in the early 2000s. And it is a fantastic story. It's really, really compelling talks about how they were basically doing something that baseball frowned upon uh, using, using the statistics in a different way and, and trying to find all of these players that might be overlooked because the team had no money and they had such a small budget. But the original book is actually tells, it doesn't, it doesn't tell the story in a way that would translate well to movie. It tells a lot about the the nitty gritty details. And so the screenplay that they wrote with Aaron Sorkin did a phenomenal job of creating an actual story around around what happened. And Brad Pitt is fantastic as Billy Bean. And even Jonah Jonah Hill does a great job as an amalgam character. His character was not actually, Peter Brand was, is a combination of characters who were working under Billy Bean at the time. So that's one thing to take into account. But the two of those and the relationship and the dynamic they have, I think one of my favorite scenes is when he walks into the room with the scouts and he starts throwing out, he starts throwing out at names and they're all groaning, no, no, we can't do this. And, and he just keeps pointing at, he just keeps pointing at Jonah Hill and it's like, what happens? He gets on base. He gets <laughs> on base. He gets on base. And, and so it's just, it was really cool because that team was really, really good. And and what they did ultimately did change did change baseball. So it's it's definitely worth seeing. Uh, the second one I chose was uh, Little Big League. This is one of the the great kids movies of the of the 90s and this stars a a kid whose grandfather owns the minnesota twins and this kid loves baseball and knows baseball inside and out so his father or his grandfather when he dies leaves this kid the baseball team and he gets so fed up over what's going on with the managing that he actually decides to manage the team himself and so this kid ends up managing the Minnesota Twins. And I love this movie growing up because there's something about the, uh, the thought process of being a kid managing a major league baseball team and getting to do all the fun, cool things that you would get to do in that position. But it was, there's, good, there's good characters in the story. It's fun. It's interesting. And it, it was just a great movie to watch as a kid. And you can, it shows you what happens when you let the power get too much to your head. Plus you got some good cameos from people like Randy Johnson and Chris Berman and Ken Griffey Jr. Have you seen this one? Mm -hmm. A long time ago though. Yeah. So this was one I loved watching as a kid. Yeah. It's right up there with like rookie of the year and Mm -hmm. a couple other movies for that nineties kid baseball experience. 
Yeah. And the last one I chose was a little different. It was for love of the game. This is one of the 900 Kevin Costner baseball movies. Um, but this is probably his least well-known one. And cause it's, it's more of a, a romantic drama played out on baseball. So it stars Kevin Costner as a pitcher pitching in his final game of his major league career. And he's in the middle of throwing this phenomenal game and they keep cutting back and forth to his entire journey throughout his major league career. And in particular, his journey with this woman that he falls in love with. So it's the story of their relationship told as flashbacks while he's throwing his final game, the final game of his career as a, as a pitcher. And so I think it's just a, it's an interesting, well-crafted story. It's one that you can watch with your, with your spouse, because uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of, of relational content in there. So it's not just simply a sports movie, but it features Kevin Costner's typical love of baseball that shines through. So I would recommend that one as well. Yeah. There's so many other good ones that we didn't even mention, like, uh, the rookie, the Sandlot, Major League One and Two, but not Three. Uh, <laughs> the whole one. There's so many good baseball movies that have come out. Yeah, yeah. So grab a few baseball movies, watch them, and look forward to the upcoming baseball season. Rob, you got anything else? Uh, does Signs qualify as a baseball movie? <laughs> Ooh, that's borderline right there. Bring away, Merrill. Bring away. <laughs> I'm going to go no on that one. That's what my vote <laughs> is going to be. It's not a baseball movie, but baseball literally saves the earth. So, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that is the show. Uh, thank you for tuning into Film for Fans. Make sure you check out our website, filmforfans.com, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch us in person as we talk about these things. You can see all my baseball hats as we talk about baseball movies. Yes. You get to see all of Rob's interesting outfits. (laughs) (laughs) Who doesn't want to see that? Who doesn't want to see that? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, until next time, enjoy the movies.